Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey, I'm Michael, and welcome to my analysis of Act 3 of Final Fantasy VI. If you're new here, you might want to check out my analyses of Acts 1 and 2 first, and maybe even my video describing my method I'm loosely using for this analysis, or the video that Molly and I made about character themes. I'm analyzing the story of the World of Ruin portion of the game, including the end, so obviously there will be spoilers. This whole video is practically one big spoiler. As I talked about in the first analysis video, each of the characters basically speak aloud their super objectives right before the final battle. However, after the events of the end of Act 2, the party has a new SO that they're all working toward together. Defeat Kafka. Other than working toward defeating Kefka, in Act 3, the characters basically all complete their SOs. I really like that Celeste is the character who gets the band back together in Act 3. Celeste went from what she thought was the height of her power before the game starts to quite a low in Act 1 when she's imprisoned. Throughout the rest of Act 1 and all of Act 2, things slowly start to get better for her. At the beginning of Act 3, though, things are lower for her than they've ever been. Just like Act 2 and near the beginning of Act 1, our point of view character wakes up in a bed with someone looking after her. It's an RPG cliche that the game starts with the main character waking up in their bedroom, and Final Fantasy VI does it three times, pretty much. Sid seems so genuinely relieved that Celeste has finally woken up, but he's obviously tired. To me, the relationship between Sid and Celeste has always seemed a little forced, and since I like him so much less, this playthrough, after thinking about his actions a little bit more, I have basically no sympathy for him. I find saving Sid to be relatively easy, but I intentionally let him die this time just for the story beats. I like that there is no music at all in Act 3 until you go out into the world map, which you can skip until the end of the stationary island if you want. The track you hear on the world map, Dark World, like the story at this point, is bleak. The wind, the trudging organ, the solo piano melody, and then the two flutes help set the scene here perfectly. It's as if Celeste really has taken Sid's line, maybe we're the only people left alive, to heart. My cover of this is what we've been hearing in the background of this video. I wondered what if the dying world were icy, and turns out, that also makes it creepy. After Sid dies, Celeste's outburst of emotion is understandable. She might be the only person alive in the world now. She goes to attempt to end her life. At the top of the cliff is a dead bird, yet another bleak touch on this point of the game. As Celeste's theme plays, she leaps off the cliff to the left, in the same direction that she throws the bouquet of flowers in the opera scene. The opera aria is about loss of love and resigning in some respect. In the aria, there is still a glimmer of hope though, and Celeste needs that hope now. The glimmering tears we see as Celeste falls effectively tug at your heartstrings. Thankfully, Celeste survives the fall. She washes ashore on the beach and finds a bird that has been bandaged. Forever Rachel plays letting us know the connection Celeste made from seeing the bandage. It strikes me a little odd that this is the theme that plays, though. It's connected with Rachel specifically, not Locke. But this theme playing here cements the idea that the theme is not Rachel's. It's about how Locke feels about Rachel. I suppose that this is the only low energy version of Locke's theme that exists. This theme's use here works like a traditional leitmotif if we think of Forever Rachel as a version of Locke's theme. So because of the music playing, we know that Celeste assumes Locke bandaged the bird. This is why it was important that Celeste watched Locke bandage Interceptor toward the end of Act 2. It technically could have been someone else who bandaged the bird, and it would still be important for her to discover that because it means that intelligent life is still out there. She sounds a bit unhinged when she asks the bird who bandaged it. Ma'am, you're yelling at a bird. Celeste finds the raft Sid made and uses it to travel to the mainland. She makes her way to Albrook, and there are plenty of people still alive here. The new track, The Day After, plays. It's still mostly pretty bleak, but the action 
in this piece suggests more determination than we've had so far. It's such a contrast from Kids Run Through the City, though. It's interesting that the barkeep in Albrook reminisces fondly on the time of the Empire's occupation when he complained about it then. We were a bit aimless at this point, so we basically just lead Celeste to the nearest town that we can find outside of Albrook. On the way, we pass Kefka's tower. It's so cool that it's so imposing and that we can't get inside it yet. It's just a hideous tower sitting there that we know we'll have to visit eventually. Adding to that sense of dread that we get from the tower, We've heard about Kefka's Light of Judgment. It can strike anywhere at any time. Upon arriving in Sen, we see it firsthand. Save them, plays, so we know we've got to take action. We find the source of the impending danger and see that Sabin is holding up an entire dang house. Have we tested to see if he could just pick up Kefka's tower and caper toss it into the ocean? Sabin was a really good choice for the second character to re-recruit in Act 3. His endless optimism is so needed here. He has no real specific ties to Celeste, and he just wants to get the gang back together. With Sabin, Celeste heads out to see who else they can find. It's so interesting that you have to explore this brand new world by foot for now. It makes you really focus on how different and dangerous everything is compared to the world of balance in Acts 1 and 2. The pair come across Moblis. This place is totally wrecked to the point that only two buildings are functional, most of the town is flooded, and we have to enter and exit the town from a completely new place. Albrook and Sen were mostly functioning the same way as they were before the end of the world. There's no sign of any people here in Moblis and no music, just a strong howling wind. In the basement of one of the two surviving buildings, you find all of the people of Moblis, and they're all children. We hear the day after the new town theme, until we find the one adult alive here, Tara. She tells us about how the Light of Judgment destroyed the town and all of the adults died in the process. As the flashback ends, Awakening begins. This is tying in closely to Tara's SO to feel love. It makes sense that she won't leave the children yet. She's essentially completed her SO here. She needs to be convinced that the party's new SO to defeat Kefka is necessary to guarantee the love that she feels with the children. Silence when Tara is done talking. You awkwardly leave the scene in that silence. Mobliz is at one end of the Serpent Trench, and there's nothing we can do here currently, so let's make the trek to the other end of the Serpent Trench. Along the way, we pass the Fanatic's Tower. It's surrounded by mountains, so we can't get to that right now. Such a cool, exciting mystery to look forward to, though. Hope it's not a letdown in any way. Upon reaching Nikea at the other end, the party runs into Gerard, who looks an awful lot like Edgar, just with a darker color scheme. Kinda looks rad, Edgar should stick to that. It's so odd to me though that Celeste is doing all the talking with Gerard and not Sabin, Edgar's actual brother. When you do get to South Figaro though, you hear kids run through the city. This suggests that South Figaro was hit a lot less hard than the other towns. As you talk to the citizens, you hear that they constantly rebuild and they're doing their best to keep the town in good shape. This is one of the most hopeful things in early act three. You follow Gerard and the thieves through the cave to South Figaro and into Figaro Castle. In the engine room of the castle, you have a pretty fun boss fight and Edgar rejoins your party. With that, Sabin's SO is complete. He has reconnected with his brother and this time it's for good. Time to visit the next new town, Kolingen. In the cafe here, the party finds Setzer. He doesn't want to rejoin the party. It's funny though that Celeste, the character who attempted to end her own life, chastises Setzer for giving up hope. At the moment Setzer is convinced to rejoin the party, his theme starts playing. It feels great. Setzer's theme is so exciting. Setzer's line, we're gonna get us another one. Airship, that is, is fist pump worthy. Daryl's tomb is one of my favorite dungeons in the game. I love the look and feel of this place. The music playing here is Phantom Forest. This theme might be a little overused or at least poorly named, but the Phantom feel definitely works here in the tomb. 
Daryl herself is a fun character. I wish we got to see more of her. Maybe there'd be some way to work her into the prequel? Her sprite even looks cool. Through the scene of Setzer's flashbacks, we hear Epitaph. Like Forever Rachel, this theme doesn't actually describe Daryl. It describes how Setzer feels about her. We know this because it is a more introspective version of Setzer's theme. The scene on the stairs is so cool. I love that we can walk past Setzer's memories happening in real time. When we talk to the present day Setzer then, he's very matter of fact. Watch your step. The music and the flashbacks are telling us what he's feeling though. The wreck of the Falcon was found a full year later in a distant land. A full year. Setzer didn't know for sure what happened to his best friend for an entire year. I can't imagine that feeling. Finding the Falcon gives Setzer some closure and completes his SO. I love watching the Falcon fly out of the water. Once we have the Falcon, we have new music on the world map, searching for friends. This track is so much more positive than Dark World and it suggests that the party now has the drive and the means to defeat Kafka. From here on, the game opens up. You can technically beat the game at any time, and you can tackle everything before Kafka's Tower in whatever order you want to. Some people don't like this aspect of the game. I don't love open world games as much myself, but I think it's appropriate to this game. We don't really know what we're doing, but we have to work to figure it out as best as we can and to try and fight for what little we have left in this world. It's pretty powerful, actually. And side note, I'll be following the order of events printed in the strategy guide. When the party sees a bird, Celeste insists that they follow it. The bird leads us to Miranda, and then another bird leads us to Zozo, and specifically Mount Zozo. It's really clear that Cyan came through Miranda though. The NPCs don't need to hit us over the head with the hints. Once we make our way to Mount Zozo, we get to hear our old friend, the Mount Colts theme again. Always a pleasure. The Storm Dragon boss here is the first actually long boss battle in the game, and that's kind of exciting. We find Cyan's room, filled with handcrafted silk flowers and letters to Lola. His last letter to Lola is actually very sweet. Cyan is releasing a bird with a message to her on the mountaintop, and we don't hear Cyan's theme until the bird flies away. That's a nice touch. I also really like how Cyan writing letters to Lola is kind of a band-aid for both of their problems. He's unable to move past his own family's death, so he can't bear to see anyone else grieving the death of a loved one. This is distracting him from working through his own problems, and as soon as the party arrives, he can move to a different distraction. This is also just delaying the inevitable for Lola. She can't move on from her lover's death until she actually learns that he died. From here, a bunch of events without much interesting plot development happen. We recruit Gao, which completes his SO, which is to have friends. We find an injured shadow and take him to Thamasa to heal up. We go to Jador and Ozer's house to recruit Realm. Ozer's house, by the way, is a really fun dungeon. With Realm in the party and with the airship, we can go recruit Strago. While recruiting Strago, we hear Realm's theme. It helps make the reunion scene really sweet. I like how Realm teases him, but it's clear she really loves Strago and her theme helps hammer this home. It helps tie this strongly back to Realm and Strago's super objectives, which are now essentially complete. They have each other. Now that we have more of the party back together and some time has passed, we can go recruit Terra. Katarin, the teen girl here, is pregnant, and her boyfriend Dwayne is the father. I like how all of the kids are processing her pregnancy differently. Some know that it means a baby's coming, and some just point out that her belly is getting bigger. Tara helps the party defend the children against a monster attack. Through this act, she realizes that she can fight, and in fact, she needs to, to defend what she cares about. So, Tara's SO is complete. Next, let's head to Phoenix Cave. I wish Final Fantasy V had done something more like Phoenix Cave with the Fork Tower. It's a fun dungeon, until I got to the part where I missed one floor switch that I just couldn't see. The music playing here is Another World of Beasts. I feel like this theme too might be a bit misused or overused. In this case, is it telling us that the treasure here is Magicite, or is it telling us that this place is kinda spooky? It's a fun little teaser that most of the chests in this cave are empty. When we finally see why that is, Locke is here. 
Celeste immediately asks if the Phoenix Magicite is for Rachel. These are the first words she's spoken to him since the end of Act 2. She's so preoccupied with her own vision of what would make her happy, a future with him. We take Locke and the Phoenix Magicite back to Kolingen. It's smart that we don't hear what in the old Coot's basement this time. It's silent for much of the scene. His name is inexplicably now Patriarch, though. I like how the Magicite shatters, and at first it seems that Locke has failed, but then the Phoenix transparent overlay appears. It's simple, but really effective. As Rachel wakes up, we hear Forever Rachel. She can't stay, though. With her line, Today I set your heart free, Locke's SO is complete. Rachel disappears, and the Phoenix Magicite is reassembled. However, I like to think that it's not just that the Magicite is whole again, Rachel is now part of the Magicite. I really like that Celeste is standing in the corner of the upstairs room of the Patriarch's house, like she doesn't know what to do with herself. When Locke comes up the stairs, she doesn't really know what to say, but it's clear that she cares for him. He says he's okay, and he's ready to rejoin the party. As he turns around to face Celeste, his theme starts to play. It's telling us that this is true, he's not just saying that he's fine. It's also a really effective musical moment. It kind of got me choked up. His theme is no longer a mask. It's his heroic dedication to life and the living, especially Celeste. With this, Celeste's super objective is now complete. Outside the house, Locke gives Celeste the treasures he found in Phoenix Cave. It's a sweet little moment. The whole party will share everything, but this feels like it's all especially a gift for her, his new adventuring partner. Hey, let's swing by and pick up Shadow at the Coliseum. Ultros is here. Why? If you talk to Siegfried, he has the line, Someone's been pretending to be me, don't be fooled. But girl, like, who even are you? With Shadow back in the party, you can stay at inns and see all of his dreams. I don't want to give it all away, but it really solidifies Shadow's tragic past while still leaving a few things that aren't completely spelled out, only heavily suggested, like the connection between Shadow and Realm. The dreams also have really creepy sound design. While we're tying up loose ends, let's get Sabin's ultimate blitz. Duncan's sprite is the same as Bannon's sprite, just recolored, so I automatically don't like him. At least his demeanor is completely different. Whoa, Sabin, this can't be. Tears? I love how my sensitive husband is not afraid of crying in front of people. Now it's time for the worst dungeon in the game. Fanatic's Tower. This dungeon is so boring. Even its music, Fanatiker, is creepy and cool at first, but the loop is way too short to have basically no melody. Let's put Locke in the party and visit Narsh. The music here is Dark World, and I really like it. It makes this town devoid of people, other than the old men locked in their houses and staying in bed, seem even more bleak. It's fun that Locke can pick the locked doors. This whole sequence is really long, though. Loot the houses, recruit Mog, leave Narsh and put Mog in your party, fight the Ice Dragon, which is an annoying fight but not that tough, fight Tritok, and then there's one more dungeon after that. At the end of this last dungeon, you can recruit Umaro. He doesn't really have an SO. His theme is appropriately surface level, just describing what he looks and acts like. I never once put Umaro in my party in this playthrough. I also picked up Gogo real quick. This dungeon is a little frustrating, actually, but it's pretty short, thankfully. Gogo similarly doesn't have a super objective, and their theme is just colorful and clowny and mysterious. I also didn't use Gogo at all on this playthrough. I know they can be really useful in battle, but I found myself wanting to spend more time with characters with more fleshed out stories. Next, I tackled another pretty long sequence, Doma Castle. I like how when everyone but Cyan wakes up after sleeping here, it almost seems like he died in his sleep. Until what starts playing. It tells us that there are some hijinks afoot. I kind of hate that the trio of monsters are called the Three Dream Stooges, and that they're named Curly, Larry, and Mo. I love the look of the Dream Realm. I love how it follows nonsense dream logic. Phantom Forest is the music here. Again, probably overused, but it is spooky at least. When we get to the second area, the Phantom Train, the music is the same here as it was the last time we were there. I love the puzzles in this section. I get why there's a Magitech section next, but I don't get why we're in a cave. 
We have the Minds of Narsh music here, even though this is definitely not Narsh. It's nice that Elaine and Owain show up here to plead with us to save Cyan, but then Rexful is such a joke of a boss if you know that you can just use X-Zone right away. Cyan comes to, and his wife and son urge him to be at peace with himself and move on. Cyan's SO is complete now. After this, I beat the dragon in the opera house and then headed to the ancient castle. Nothing really important to the plot happens here, it's just an excuse to get you an incredibly powerful esper and an overpowered relic. The music here is the Serpent Trench. It doesn't really fit, but it's nice to use it again, I guess. I never have the patience to teach everyone Meteor from Odin before it gets transformed into Raiden. I like the story of Odin and the Queen, but I wish it were expanded more or somehow connected to the current story a little better. Note to self, in my prequel game, which I almost definitely will never actually make, Leo is obsessed with the myth of Odin and constantly mentions it to Celeste. I also completed the Ebot's Rock quest. What a lazy dungeon. It's not Tower of Fanatics bad, but it's not much better. I didn't even get Grand Train. I tried to slowly take everything out and use only physical attacks, but Hedon just never cast the spell and I killed it. Oh well. Now that pretty much everyone's SO is complete, it's time to take on Kefka's tower and complete the party's combined SO. I love that this tower is a mix of things from Vector, lots of machinery, but also bits of earth held together by magic. It's imposing and confusing and threatening and last dungeon, the music playing here helps set that mood. I like that it seems to take some slight hints of Kefka's theme and weaves them into something scarier and more powerful sounding. I love most of the boss battles here and it's great to get to hear fierce battle again for them. The designs of these bosses are mostly great. I especially love the statues designs. The goddess design especially is fantastic, especially with the allusion to revelation that it seems to be. The dragons though are a complete letdown and they really have been throughout Act 3. When we finally reach Kafka, we hear Fanatiker. Great. This one again. At least this time we aren't winding up or down endless flights of stairs. It's in this conversation with Kafka that everyone states their super objectives, which they have mostly completed, save for defeating Kafka. Right before the battle, we get to hear one last Kafka's theme, and I'm thankful for that. And then it's time for the final battle. It really is fun to take on a multi-stage battle, and it's fun that it's a bit of a surprise the first time. You just keep going up and up and up, facing beings that are either imposing, disturbing, or intriguingly religious coded. And of course, we hear the incredible, incredible dancing mad throughout this. Honestly, I think this is the best track in the entire series. It matches how the boss is also imposing, disturbing, or religious coded. I could gush on and on about Dancing Mad, but it would take me way too long to notate the entire thing and give it a full analysis. I checked to see if anyone else had created an analysis of Dancing Mad for YouTube, and what do you know, my favorite YouTube music theorist, 8-Bit Music Theory, made a video about it. It's linked in the description below, and it's excellent. Check it out. He actually has a series of three videos on the music of Final Fantasy VI, and they're all good. After Kefka is defeated, the tower, which had been held together by magic, begins to crumble. The party has to rush back to the airship, just like they had to rush off the floating continent. Hopefully it doesn't end in disaster this time. Terra decides to lead the party out in her Esper form, even though magic is slowly leaving this world. This gives the party a new pair of main objectives for the finale. Escape with their lives, and make sure Terra survives too. On the way out, most of the characters have added little scenes that relate back to their super objectives or other character traits throughout. Cyan achieves some personal growth and learns to operate a simple machine. Setzer uses his risk-taking style to benefit everyone. Sabin solidifies his completed SO by being such a nice guy to his brother, supporting him in a way he always knew he could, letting Edgar lead where he wouldn't have been as capable. Locke once again gets an opportunity to protect Celeste, thus not repeating the cycle that he had with Rachel. Realm gets to further connect with Strago. Shadow makes peace with his past and completes his super objective finally. Throughout all of this, we've been hearing the ending theme. 
It's another brilliant piece of music that weaves together all of the character themes from the game. The most successful moment is when Locke and Celeste's themes are intertwined. Check this out. It starts with the standard first eight bars of Celeste's theme in the oboe. When the theme starts into the second set of eight bars, this time played by the violins, Locke's theme enters underneath on the horn. This is another supremely operatic moment. It's as if the soprano and tenor leads finally get to sing together in a love duet in the grand finale. Don't get mad at me, Erica and other mezzos. I know Celeste is a mezzo, but look at this range. The two themes follow Locke's chord progression, which has more colorful chords. After four bars of singing together, Celeste's theme cuts out. Locke's theme stops on the dominant. The oboe comes back in, repeating a fragment of Locke's theme with different chords, and the oboe and horn trade this fragment back and forth with ever more colorful chords, walking down until we reach flat six. Here, the theme starts over with the horn and strings playing Locke's theme in octaves. When we reach the section where the fragment was passed back and forth, stepping down moments ago, this time the melody climbs while the bass continues to step down. This broadens everything, which helps make the 2-5-1 cadence feel even weightier. Side note, if you have any questions about any of the chords I used, write them in the comments below. I might have an answer for why I wrote something the way I did, or I might have just made a mistake. I love that Setzer watches Celeste and Locke's moment together. It's a bit of closure for him, too. He had feelings for Celeste as well, even if they were brief. When Tara's theme appears in the ending theme, it starts off as just the heroic B section, but then a modified A section returns as she watches the Maduin Magicite, the remains of her father, disappear. He tells her that if she has a strong enough connection to people who love her, she should be able to live as only a human. As if to test this theory, Terra is flying in front of the airship in her esper form, but then reverts to a human form and begins to fall. Setzer is able to dive with the airship and catch her. And then the final fantasy theme plays as Katarin's baby is born. I'm getting a little misty-eyed around now. I seem to always be when the Final Fantasy theme plays in the end credits of any Final Fantasy game. We see the party collapsed on the deck of the ship, but where's Terra? Celeste finds her, and she's okay. I love that Celeste is the one to look for Terra and to find her. As the party flies around the world, newly liberated from its tyrannical self-made god, it seems that the planet is healing as magic disappears. The water looks cleaner already, and the grass seems like it's growing. Terra lets her hair down. The programmers and designers went through the effort of including that in this the last moment of the game. Terra is free of her burdens, as is the rest of the cast. They've all met their individual SOs, except for maybe Edgar, but see my Act 1 discussion for more on that. And everyone has overcome Kafka. Terra's hair flows in the wind. I am emotionally a wreck at this point. I don't know what more there is to say about this brilliant, brilliant game but you can look for a full review in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know any comments, other interpretations, or questions you have in the comments below. Please give this video a like if you liked it, or give it a pity like if you hated it. Please subscribe if you aren't subscribed already. 
maintain your groovy selves.